I also welcome to you the coordinator of this event, our respected director, Professor G. S. Tomar sir. I also welcome to Dean Admin, Dean Academic, all HODs, my colleagues and students. Now I introduce today's expert in brief. Professor A. Jenswart is working in the Department of Electrical, Electronic and Computer Engineering, Central University of Technology, South Africa. He has completed DTEC and Master of Education from Wall University of Technology, South Africa. Apart from this, he has also worked in many universities and industries. He has received various awards like Career Advanced Teaching, Research Excellence, Research Achievement, and many more. Professor Swart is the member of various scientific societies such as IEEE, SAIE, etc. Professor Swart has published more than 175 research papers in various scripted journals and conferences. Now, without any further delay, I invite our today's expert, Professor Swart, to deliver his lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Welcome uh, to all the uh, ladies and gentlemen present today online. It's lovely to see so many names. Unfortunately, I can't see the faces. W would it be possible just to quickly show me uh, just the faces, ladies and gentlemen, just, just for 10 seconds? Can you just put your videos on so I can just see the faces? Uh, you know, faces, uh, or you remember faces more or more more clearer than what you remember names is it possible for the attendees just to just for 10 seconds or five seconds to put their videos on so all the students are requested to open video for just five seconds yes ah please. there we go there i see one very good excellent i need to see some more ah there we go there's one more come ladies and gentlemen we we, we must be able to just just for a few so seconds show me Professor James White is an expert of a cricket and he is coming to Sonbat for playing a match against the Irish at Sonbat. Ah, there we have another one. Yes, we have another one. Very good. Excellent. Uh, come, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there must be some, some ladies. Isn't there some ladies in the audience? Come, ladies. Please, ladies. Let's see who you are. Just for five seconds and you can switch off again. Let's see, come see some more faces. There we go. Some more faces. Okay. No, it's all right. Uh, we, we might be camera shy. Thank you. You may switch off. You may switch off. <laughs> All right. So, so ladies and gentlemen, my, my research that I am uh, sharing with you this, this morning uh, isn't per se electrical engineering. It, it has to do with academic student support. In other words, how do I, as a, as a lecturer, how do I, as a supervisor, how do I support my student so that the student can, can succeed? And, and we're not talking here about, ladies and gentlemen, giving extra work to students to work through for preparation for an exam. Or I'm, I'm not talking about uh, extra tutorials or laboratory work. No, 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 no. What I'm talking about is what help do I give students before they even start the course? And primarily, ladies and gentlemen, we are looking at first-year students. What help do I give my first-year students? Now, you might think, but how is that relevant to engineering, and specifically electronic or electrical engineering? Well, unfortunately, uh, ladies and gentlemen, some students, when they come from school, they leave their school career, and they join the university, very few of them have ever been in a laboratory. Very few of them know what an oscilloscope or a multimeter is. Well, in, in the South African context, it is so. M many of them do not have an idea about circuit simplification in, in terms of resistors, simplifying them to find the total resistance. And so these are absolutely new concepts. Even higher education is new to them. They might have experienced something completely different in, in high school, in their school career. But now, how do they adapt? How do they find their feet at the university so that they can succeed? And, and that is a critical um, question, ladies and gentlemen. How can they succeed? Because, unfortunately, 
the, the high dropout of first year students is is really worrying. It's worrying not only in South Africa, but in many African countries. Uh, for example, in the module I teach, Electronic Fundamentals 1, that's a first year module, we have a, a, a general intake of about 500 students. But of those 500 students, only 300 go to the exam. Where's the other 200? Drop out. The students just can't seem to find their feet. They can't seem to, to make the adaption to higher education. And that is a, a common problem in many, many universities in South Africa. Uh, that is why one of the, the initiatives from the government has been a student peer mentorship program where senior students help first year students and they become like mentors and, and they spend time together guiding the first year student to try and really find their feet in a in a, in a quick way so that they can succeed. And so that is what my, my presentation is about. Please allow me just to uh, share that with you. If I can just first, uh, uh, let me just quickly see if I can find the, the presentation. There we go. Okay, there we go. Um, uh, uh, Professor Pandy, may you just nod your head if you are seeing my presentation, please? Yes, yes. Yes, yes sir. Yes, Professor, your presentation is visible to all of us. Good. I'm just going to enter the full slideshow. Yes, please. Right, here we go. Yes, Pandy. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. So, yeah, you can see, ladies and gentlemen, it's undergraduate student perceptions. Again, it's the first year students, but it's their perceptions of what skills will they need going into their university career. What self-management skills, what, what attitude skills will they need uh, to make a success of their higher education career? And so again, I want to just re-emphasize that this is done, this, this study or the, the results of the study are, are regarding students who come into the university for the first time and before they even start with any course. This is where this is, this is applied. So we just understand the context. So if we then consider just the overview, we will briefly consider the introduction, the importance of academic student support. We look at the context, a little bit more detail, the methodology, the results. So here's a thought to ponder, ladies and gentlemen. This is now a gentleman who is working for a company where they give support. He says, thank you for calling to say something positive. We don't get a lot of that in tech support. Now, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, um, many companies that provide support uh, when they get telephone calls, it's complaints, isn't it so? But sometimes it's also good to find them and say, hey, thank you for this or thank you for that upgrade to the app or whatever the case may be. I'm sure the, the tech support will enjoy that positive encouragement too. And so something positive usually motivates somebody. And, and that is what we are trying to do in this case too, ladies and gentlemen. We are trying to find something positive to give to the students so that they can be motivated through their higher education career. This is a, a noteworthy uh, quote from Adam Grant. The mark of higher education isn't the knowledge you accumulate in your head. It's the skills you gain about how to learn. Why is that relevant? Well, consider IT. They speak about knowledge turnover. In the information technology, uh, the knowledge turnover is basically 18 months, more or less. So that means every year and a half, they've got to write a new textbook because the, the information, the, the curriculum has, has changed. So we cannot in IT teach somebody information of five or 10 years ago. It doesn't work that way. In electrical engineering, we think of cell phone technology. Back in 1995, my very first cell phone was a massive cell phone this size. It, it, was, it weighed almost one kilogram, ladies and gentlemen. It was, it was a massive cell phone. Today, today, cell phones weigh 100 grams. They are, the technology is incredibly. But do I teach my students still something of 20 years ago? Cannot happen. And so knowledge turnover. So we can't really be teaching students knowledge, ladies and gentlemen. We need to teach them skills lifelong learning skills so that as the knowledge turnover occurs they will be able to find the knowledge themselves and apply it whether it is in industry or society to the benefit both of their communities and the country in which they are living 
we must remember that each person has to contribute to the socio-economic development of their communities and countries. Otherwise, we will not survive in a sustainable global economy, ladies and gentlemen, that is fast moving forward and is, is changing rapidly all the time. So one of the, so one 12, of the skills 12 skills that the International Engineering Alliance refers to is lifelong learning, as I just mentioned. I am not sure how many of you are familiar with the IEA. It's a statutory international body. They hold the Dublin, Washington, and Sydney Accords, which many countries adopt, engineering uh, countries that offer engineering programs. They have become signatories to these accords, and they uh, adopt a certain uh, curriculum and also uh, adopt a certain way of teaching students so that the quality of education can be consistent around the globe. Of course, it also comes down to the qualification. Is a qualification of a student in India valid in South Africa? Is an electrical engineering qualification of South Africa valid in India? Well, if the, the uh, universities or the, the country have adopted those accords, then yes, that uh, uh, qualification becomes a standard worldwide and it becomes recognizable as a quality, a, quali a qualification of quality. And so the, these standards that have been uh, adopted, and especially these graduate attributes, need to be um, incorporated into all engineering curricula so that they can adhere to the global standard that has been set. Now, CUT, Central University of Technology, also has a set of graduate attributes. They have 10, and you can actually match the 10 to the 12, the 12 of the uh, IEA. And so these graduate attributes, ladies and gentlemen, are not really skills, but it is something that the student must be able to demonstrate in his or her life while at university. Uh, one of the skills involves communication. Can the student communicate in written form, in oral form? Uh, can it can it communicate via PowerPoint presentation? So communication is also a, an attribute that students must cultivate and demonstrate while at university. Now, this, of course, calls for different, what they refer to, intrapersonal and interpersonal skills. Now, uh, we will touch on what the difference is between those two shortly. Just look here at the 12 IEA graduate attributes. You'll see they are listed on the left. It's quite a complex table. I apologize for that. But it shows you the 12 IEA attributes on the left. Like you'll see lifelong learning is right at the bottom. Communication is third from the bottom. One of the most important attributes that any engineering student should be able to demonstrate is problem solving. And you'll see that's the third one, design, development of solutions in a response to problem analysis. In the middle column, in the middle column here, you can see that is the CUT graduate attributes that have been uh, accepted. They can be correlated, but on the right-hand side, ladies and gentlemen, you can find a definition of those attributes. And if you look at the lifelong learning one, that's the one that we're really interested in because we said knowledge turnover occurs very regular. So students must be able to learn wherever they are, even when they leave the university. Do they have the skill to continue to learn? So bottom right, it speaks about entrepreneurship. So through entrepreneurship at CUT, we encourage students to become involved in lifelong learning and to, to demonstrate that specific attribute. So these are vital, ladies and gentlemen, and also these attributes need to be assessed. And that's a, a topic all on its own. But how do you assess each student that those 12 attributes have been presented or have been demonstrated by that student? And that is a topic for a different uh, discussion or a different day. So we are talking then about interpersonal and intrapersonal skills. So it's the, it's the lifelong learning skills as well as the communication skills. Those are the two of the graduate attributes which we are uh, focusing on. Now, interpersonal, of course, speaks about relationships with others, while intra is really the relationship you have with yourself. How do I see myself? How do I set my time? How, what goals do I set? And it's really it's got to do with self-directed learning. Can a student learn on his or her own? Or does that student need to be taken by the hand and led everywhere? That, that, that cannot be, ladies and gentlemen. Students have to become self-directed, independent, lifelong learners. So 
this uh, graph or image shows the difference between intrapersonal and inter. So intra is really, it's, it's, it's discussing a discussion with oneself. Uh, and you look at your perceptions, your attitudes, your goals, your character. Where inter, interpersonal is really the social skills and the communication with others. Now, this specific um, research that we are engaging with, and, and it runs every semester, ladies and gentlemen, every semester when I have my first year students, we share this information with them. We share the questionnaire with them, which I will uh, share with you so shortly. And we encourage them to look at themselves. What is their time management skills like? What is their attitude like with regard to study? What are their goals that they personally have? Now, studies in general have shown that um, poor time management, ladies and gentlemen, impacts negatively on academic success. And that is very true. And also, studies have shown that motivation, if a student is not motivated, if he does not have goals, he's not going to succeed. And so we want to try and get students to be motivated up front, and we want to have them have the right uh, skills, skill set, the, the right um, frame of mind so that they can succeed with their studies. And so this brings us to academic student support. Some academics feel this belongs only with certain departments at university. For instance, the Center for Innovation in Teaching and Learning. They should provide academic support. No, ladies and gentlemen. It is every, every academic's responsibility to provide this type of support to his students or her students. Because it really shows a caring attitude. It shows the academic values his or her students. And does not just leave them to find their own way through the university. Each academic must spend some time in giving academic students support. Now, there are various academic student supports listed in the literature, advising, mental health, financial health, tutoring, basic needs, that's the one aspect of our study, as is planning, uh, and specifically time management planning. So we're focusing on, on those two, academic student support that uh, academics should provide to their students, and uh, especially if they are first-year students. So four types have, of academic support have been proposed in the literature. You'll see it's emotional, informational, instrumental, and identity. We are looking at the instrumental one because we're really looking at life skills. We're looking at what skill does a student have inside him or what skill inside the student needs to maybe change, be amplified or modified so that they can succeed in higher education. So students need to become self-regulated, self-directed learners. And so Karleski and Isbista, they mentioned the point amplifying or dampening behaviors. In other words, if I have a, a tendency to be late in submitting my assignments, then that, that, that behavior needs to be dampened and changed. However, if I'm always on time for attending a specific class, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, then that's an attitude or, or, or a, a behavior that needs to be amplified on time. And so that is what this study is all about, ladies and gentlemen, helping students to amplify or dampen behaviors within themselves that they see as problematic, that they see, not that I see. Remember, I don't know all these students that are coming into my class for the first time. The students know themselves. I need to share information with them so that they can look at themselves and see what needs to be amplified or what needs to be dampened within themselves. So, as we said, it's first year engineering, electronic fundamentals one. It's a compulsory model module in a diploma um, in engineering qualification in South Africa. Uh, 300 students over the last few years. This semester, we had 500 students who, who registered for it. You can see the syllabus there at the bottom. It covers oscilloscopes, uh, power supply design, amplifiers. And of course, we introduce students to the breadboard. And we'll touch on that soon. So this was a photo taken this semester. You see a very few number of students in the class. We had to practice social distancing and of course, uh, the masks. Uh, and um, we had to split the students over a four week period. Uh, they only came in for one hour session, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, they are working with the oscilloscope and the signal jet. Remember, they've never seen an oscilloscope. 
and a signal generator in their life before. You might say, yeah, but they can learn that via simulation. Simulation has its place. But ladies and gentlemen, nothing beats the hands on feel. The feel of the knob, the, the feel of the, 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 the equipment, um, uh, seeing actually how things change as we move that signal gen around, uh, just that hands on. And, and that's a very important um, attribute that EXA, EXA is the Engineering Council of South Africa. They ascribe to the IEH, the 12 graduate attributes. They are a signatories to the Dublin, Sydney and Washington Accords, EXA in South Africa. And they are really pushing hands on, ladies and gentlemen. You must have hands on experience because that is lacking among many of our graduates. So simulation, yes, does play its role, but the hands on is also vitally important. So, breadboard, what comes to your mind? Well, our first year students think of a breadboard, <laughs> a board where you cut bread. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in electrical engineering, when we speak about a breadboard, we don't think of this. We think of a a board with holes in white basically basically white where we can put uh, components in to to create a circuit and that bread board ladies and gentlemen needs to explain be explained to students because they've got no idea how to work with it again you might say yeah but that's why simulation is there there are two things ladies and gentlemen that simulation cannot show to a student when it comes to a breadboard sometimes a student takes a, a resistor he pushes it into the breadboard, but he pushes it in too deep. He, he, just, he just wants to force the entire resistor in. And what happens? The legs of the resistor, they curl or they bend in within the breadboard. And now, of course, there's a resistor next to it. And now what happens? The two legs, they touch each other. We, we create shorts or the students create short circuits within the breadboard. That's something that simulation cannot show the student. And, of course, how to do fault finding on that. Another thing that the simulation cannot show is how much pressure is required to push an LED into a breadboard? Ladies and gentlemen, you, you can only push it so much. If you push it too much, the legs are going to bend or you're going to have it curling inside it or you're going to damage the component. So the amount of pressure you need to get the component into the breadboard is also important for the student to feel, to experience the hands-on. Simulation cannot provide that. And so the hands-on experience is vitally important. And so that is really what we are teaching our first year students uh, at, at uh, CUT, uh, the really the introduction that the fundamentals of electronics. So they've never seen this before in their life. So if they haven't seen this, ladies and gentlemen, then most probably they don't have the right management skills, star management skills. They, they don't have the right attitude, maybe. They don't have the right uh, uh, intra intrapersonal skills that are required to succeed. So we are looking at uh, two years of data. It's actually three. It's 2016, 17, and 18. It's three years of data. Closed-ended questions. We ask student closed-ended questions. Is, uh, why? Because it's more precise, uh, and also it's easier to analyze the closed-ended questions. So before the semester even starts, the academic shares with students a, a, a few published articles, which the researcher has compl uh, completed in the previous years. Mm, excuse me. And, and these articles, ladies and gentlemen, that the, that the researcher shares with the students focuses on time management, deficiency needs, that's the basic needs of the students, it's going to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and then stress, stress or anxiety. And of course, other, and, and sorry, there's another one on attitude, what is the student's attitude? So they share these four articles, they ask the students, the academic asks the students to read specific portions of these articles, not everything. Maybe the introduction, maybe the conclusion, maybe the literature review. And then we open a test. We open a test on the online learning management system, which basically is a questionnaire. And we ask students to fill in specific things there. Uh, what do they see would be a, a problem for them? What do they want to address? So in other words, I am not telling the student what attitude he should have. I'm asking the student to try and identify himself or herself what should they be doing what skills should they be having so it's really it's a reflection an inner reflection from, from the student to see what is missing in his or her life and what they need to to amplify uh, so that they can succeed and, and that's very important ladies and gentlemen to amplify or dampen specific behaviors or or attitudes 
So this, these questionnaires, as I said, that we, or this questionnaire that we share on the online management system is based on previous research, and it's also based on Maslow's hierarchy. And uh, so they have been validated and they are reliable. And, and that's a very important um, tool, not a very important tool, a very important concept, ladies and gentlemen, in research. Any questionnaire you use, we cannot just out of my thumb or just out of the air pluck questions for students to answer. No, ladies and gentlemen, questionnaires need to be validated. They need to be reliable. What do we mean by valid? Well, if you look at the sketch on the, on the, on the, on the left, we can see that uh, this was maybe dart throwing. It's reliable. In other words, all the dots are around the same area, but it's not valid. It's not in the middle. And so too with a questionnaire, I can distribute a questionnaire to a number of different people over time. Do I get the same type of responses? If I do, then it is reliable. It's giving me the same type of information I'm looking for. However, what is valid? Well, look on the right-hand side. There is valid. All the dots are concentrated. It's reliable, but also valid. It's concentrated around the middle. So is my questionnaire really giving me the answers I want with regard to my topic? For example, if I'm looking at time management skills, but I ask students about their budget, the two are not, they, 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 there's no real relevance between a budget and time management skills, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm not really testing what I want to test. And then the questionnaire does not become valid. We must test what we want to test. And we must get similar responses over a period of time. Then the questionnaire becomes both valid and reliable. So let's look at a couple of the results then, just for the for few, for next few minutes. Um, Professor Pandy, how am I doing with time? Do I still have seven minutes left? I hope I've still got seven minutes. So, uh, yeah, it's just the language. You can see, ladies and gentlemen, the dominant language is Susutu. And that is the dominant language in the, 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 the free state province of South Africa, where we are located. We have uh, nine. We have nine provinces in South Africa, nine provinces. And uh, we are in the free state. That's right, right in the middle. Uh, you can see the students, the age, 20 to 24, majority. So they've just left uh, high school. They've just left their, their schooling career. They, enter, they are entering university for the very first time. And then, unfortunately, we have more males than females. That's very sad, ladies and gentlemen, in, in, in engineering, electrical engineering. I would like to see the female count come more up. We, we must really encourage more females to enter engineering. That is why we have the drive women in engineering and also driven by the IEEE. And uh, we should do our part to try and encourage more females to um, be part of this dynamic field engineering. So that's just a bit of the, uh, the, the, the student background profile. So here we ask students to identify what could challenge them. Remember, we're not telling them this is going to be a challenge. We're saying these are the challenges. Please identify what will be to you a challenge. And you can see 450, that's a high percentage of students, said poor time management. That's really good. They're going to struggle with that. So obviously that is something they bring from their high school career. And it's something that will need to be addressed, their, their time management. And so that, that is why with a learning management system, we, we give deadlines, but we give weekly reminders. Every week we tell the student, this is due this week. This needs to be done this week. So on a Monday, we will tell them what is due on a Friday. And so by means of reminders, we can also help the students to, uh, to get this time management in, 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 in place. Then absence of deficiency needs. Those are the basic needs, such as um, uh, feeling safe, having a good network of friends, exercise, sleep. Uh, not many students said that will be a problem. So many of them seem to have that under, under control. And then 277 said stress. They, they might struggle with stress. Of course, ladies and gentlemen, we are not psychologists or psychiatrists, so we, we then guide the student to that uh, uh, specific department at CUT. We have a health and wellness center, and if students are really struggling with the stress, then we, we make them aware of that center to, to go to. Now, what time management tools will they be using? And so we would they, remember the previous slide said time management is going to be a problem. Well, then let's think of some tools. And we, we, we share eight tools with them and we pick. And we say to them, now pick which tools will you use this semester? 586 said a schedule. They will implement a schedule. Now, a schedule, ladies and gentlemen, educational psychologist says is vital. So where I'm sitting here is at the table. And 
as a student, I should have against the wall a schedule, a weekly schedule. Monday at 10 o'clock, I must study Electronic Fundamentals 1. Tuesday at 5 o'clock, I must do reading for maths. Wednesday at 3 o'clock, I must do my assignment for digital systems or whatever the case may be. There has to be a weekly schedule. Even for a master's and, and doctoral student, ladies and gentlemen, there has to be some type of schedule. Every Friday at 5 o'clock, I will do some reading. Every Saturday at 3 o'clock, I will do some typing. If there's no schedule, ladies and gentlemen, then the study process becomes haphazardous. It becomes chaotic. It actually deters. Unfortunately, many of our students in South Africa face that because of the rural poor background which they come from. Many of them struggle even to pay the university studies. And so that is why some universities in South Africa have started uh, breakfast programs where they give an apple or a banana to each first year student coming in to try and alleviate that problem. So, so that is a, a real concern. Um, a secure study area was the second highest one. And uh, yeah, in South Africa, the rate of crime is, is very significant. Uh, students are often robbed of their laptops or cell phones on the way from, from their residence place to where the university is. And so that is also a challenge, a goal or something that students will, will have to see how they can cope with. Again, the health and wellness being uh, centered at, the, at university also helps them to deal with trauma that might come from such an experience. But the daily breakfast is a challenge and we try and encourage students, just an apple, if they can just have an apple before they come to the university, that will help a lot. Further goals that they should set, uh, which was noteworthy, the one in the middle, focus on the positive aspects of their studies. Try and do that more. Try and avoid pessimism. You can see there on the left, try not to think I'm going to fail. Try not to think this is too difficult. No, no, no. If we think that way, then most probably we will fail. It will be too difficult. But we need to cultivate a positive attitude. And then we will be able to, to succeed. Also noteworthy on the right, that these students will seek to help other students who might be struggling. And, and that is a, a very good way, ladies and gentlemen, to overcome negative thinking and to become more positive, is to help fellow students. And giving us a measure of action, indeed. This is a, what do they think will help them to succeed? Their circumstances or their attitude? It's, it's, it's worrying that 103 students say it's their circumstances. It's not true, ladies and gentlemen. It's really, it's my attitude, my, my positivism, my, my outlook. That is really what will help me to succeed at university. My, my 
by amplifying certain management tool skills, uh, tools, management tools, amplifying them and, and dampening others that are bad. That is really what is going to help me and help the students to succeed. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, we wanted students to identify for themselves what tools they need or what challenges they will have. Daily breakfast was a major challenge that they will also need to keep in mind. And as I said, just a simple apple in the morning will help with that. And an, an apple more or less is about five rand. Uh, I don't know how, um, five rand in South Africa. Uh, I don't know how, many, how much dollars is that? That's about uh, half a dollar, I think. Half a dollar is, is an apple, more or less. Is that right? Half a dollar. Um, what, what we also see as, as threats to students and what students identified was that well-outlined schedule. They must have a schedule and they must have that place for studying. They, they need to have that. And many students said they will introduce that into their routine. What was encouraging is that 85% said the attitude. Yes, they must have the right attitude to succeed, to be motivated. So that was great. That other 15% though, that's a bit worrying. And they also said they will focus on the positive aspects of their study. And, and not try and be too negative. So that was, was great. So again, ladies and gentlemen, this is help offered at the beginning of the semester. These eight tools, eight, you know, the eight uh, time management tools are shared with them at the beginning, and they are asked to select them and to implement, to implement these tools going forward. And that really will help them to improve their success. Uh, maybe I can just note, ladies and gentlemen, as a, almost a final comment. Uh, previously, in 2015, 2014, 2013, when this module was offered, Electronics, Electronic Fundamentals 1, there was no such academic student support. And the average pass rate was about 50%, which is not good, ladies and gentlemen, not good at all. Now, from 2016 up until now, we've included this academic student support. We've, acted, we've included a few other aspects too. Pass rate is now around 80%, ladies and gentlemen. We feel that this is having a significant uh, uh, impact on student success. Final thought to ponder. Final thought to ponder. The teacher said I should learn to think for myself. I think I'll stay home tomorrow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we don't want students to think that way. We want them to think I must go to university today. I must be positive today. And that's really what we want them to think, to become self-regulated learners, to become independent, lifelong learners who can find knowledge for themselves as it changes and that contribute to the socio-economic development of their communities and the country at large. And I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time this morning, and I will be glad to answer any questions.